start that video? <clears throat> but I, I guess that's not important. I, yeah, that's enough. custodian over at the back apartments back but but you know that don't you you know that i guess you, nobody here can see me or hear me except you you i didn't bring a gift i but i i guess that's not important I, Thank you for everything you've done for me. I, as long as I can remember, you've been right by my side. I'll never forget when you walked with me right in those first few hours after I lost Martha. I have always been able to count on you when I felt dark inside and when I... And you were right there, right every time. Right there, even when I didn't feel good about myself, I knew that you cared for me enough, and I, I, that made me feel better. I, I, like the time I got mad with Mabel Huntington because she broke her pipes on purpose, just so she could have somebody to see while I came up and fixed them for her. Boy, I hollered at her, like, boy, I hollered real loud. But then, then I got to thinking, you love Mabel just as much as you love me. And I should treat her the way you want me to. I, I believe I talked to you about that at the time. I, well, I started visiting her and we became friends. And I saw her all, almost every day until the day she died. Just my finest friend, and and that means that I, I can hold my head high wherever I go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you can't watch the rest of the movie. Oh. <laughs> I know who that was. Okay. <laughs> and uh, it's a wonderful life. I watched that last night. <laughs> it was odd. So, um, <clears throat> last week uh, I talked about a song while he was on the cross, I was on his mind, and just ministered mostly out of that song. And, and uh, part of my message is that God is with us, but I didn't get to that part last week last Sunday but Isaiah 7 verse 14 says therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign behold a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel and you know Isaiah prophesied that some seven or eight hundred years before Christ came on this earth before he he walked this earth Isaiah prophesied that. And there was something like uh, 330 prophecies about Christ, and every one of them were fulfilled uh, to the exact word. And, you know, the probability of that happening is like you win in the lottery 10 times in a row. Yeah. But, and, and that's what really, that's what really, uh, solidifies my faith, you know, because Jesus wasn't a self-proclaimed prophet. I mean, the, the Bible prophesied of him, and, and on Thursday nights we're going through the Old Testament and seeing uh, the prophecies, and, 
and, uh, and, and all that, that God spoke. You know, the Old Testament Christ was concealed, and then the New Testament Christ was revealed. And so all these prophecies about Christ came to pass when he was, when he was born. And John said, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But Isaiah said, therefore the Lord himself shall conceive and, and give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And Matthew 1, 22, 23 is the fulfillment of that verse. Now all that was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. How many know what that means? Which is being interpreted, God with us. God with us. Ezekiel, or Exodus 33, 12 through 15. You know, Moses, um, had, it, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of, uh, of what was going on here before we, we get to verse 12. But he had just come down from the mount, and, and the people were rebelling against God and, and uh, having a big party and everything and making a calf and everything. And, and, uh, and so, you know, God was ready to destroy this people. I mean, it was the congregation from hell. I mean, I wouldn't have wanted to have been the pastor of the Exodus church because it was rough. And so they were always murmuring and complaining and everything. And then in, in, in verse 12, it says, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring this people up. And a couple of verses it, it, early in the chapter, God says, uh, These are the people that you brought out. So it's like they're tossing it back and forth. These are your people. No, they're your people. <laughs> you know? And so God says, Moses said, uh, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say unto me, bring this people bring up this people but you have not let me know whom you will send with me for yet you have said I know you by name and you have found favor in my sight now therefore if I have found favor in your sight please show me uh, now your ways that I might uh, that I might know to find favor in your sight Consider, too, that this nation is yours, is your people. So, so Moses was throwing it back on him. God, show me your ways, and, and, uh, don't, and don't forget, these are your people, God. And so, and, and, and then he said, God said to Moses, my presence will go with you. And a couple of verses ahead of time, when God was set with, with these people, he said he wasn't going to go with them. And so Moses uh, was, was interceding on behalf of these people, and God said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight? And I and your people, is it not in you going with us? And Moses was saying, God, I'm not going to go any further unless your presence goes with us. And, you know, I think that's, that's the attitude that we have to have in life. I mean, we could, we could do life in our, on our own strength and, and in our own ways. And, and uh, you know, we, we, sometimes we could have a, a, a pretty successful life according to the world, world standards. But God wants to go with you. He, he wants to be a part of your life. He created us so we would have fellowship with him. And, and, and if you don't have that fellowship with him, if you don't have that relationship with him, you're, you're, you're missing a, a very important part of your life. And we try and fill that sometimes with, with all kinds of stuff, drugs or alcohol or, or work or whatever it might be. We try and fill that void that God put in us. And we're, we're not complete until we, we, we repent of our sins and we ask Jesus to come into our life and then he makes us complete. The Bible says that we are complete in him. And when you have his presence in your life, you could finally rest because you're at peace with God. I may know what I'm talking about. 
that's real peace. That you're at peace with God. And so Moses was saying, Lord, I, I, I don't want to do ministry any longer and, 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 and pastor this congregation that's you. They're your people, God. I don't want to pastor them any longer unless you go with me. You know, we could learn how to do ministry, and sometimes, sometimes uh, you know, we could do it without God. I heard somebody say that it, some churches, if, if the Holy Spirit left, they would never know that he left. That's pretty sad, isn't it? Because we know how to do church. We know how to do ministry. But we want, we want God with us. Amen? Amen. Because the, the power of God and the anointing of God is the only thing that's going to break the yoke Amen. on people's lives and break, break the bondage in their lives. I know for myself, before I got saved, I was, I was in bondage to, to drugs, and, and it wasn't until the Lord Jesus came into my life, he broke that power of that thing over my life. And not only that, I quit cussing. I got a new language, and, uh, and God completely gave me a brand new life. And so we need the power of God. We need the anointing of God. And Moses said, Lord, I'm, I'm just not going without you. And God was saying to Moses, because my presence is going with you, you could find rest. And in that, I will, uh, I will be with you, leading this people. You know, God doesn't call the equipped, but he equips the called. And he'll call you always to do something that you're not equipped to do. But once you answer the call and say, okay, God, I'm going to do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be obedient to what you're calling me to do. Then he equips you. He's not going to equip you before you answer the call. But once you answer the call, then God begins to equip you. And so Moses was saying, these are your people, and I can't do this without your presence. And God said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. You know, a lot of times the reason... We're, we, we have stress in our lives and we have all this uh, stuff going on is because we're not resting in God. We, we don't have his presence in our lives. How many can tell when God's presence is with you and, and he's not? Huh? How many know when you're in the spirit and when you're in the flesh? <laughs> <laughs> How many, how many can tell when somebody's in the flesh? <laughs> Amen. And in Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy um, there was laws that God gave concerning warfare. And listen to this. This is awesome. When you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is, is what? He's with you, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when you draw near to the battle, the priest shall come forward and speak to the people and shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are drawing near for the battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint. Do not fear or panic or be in dread of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. He was saying, when you go out to war against your enemies, I may know that we're in a war, and you see horses and chariots that are larger than you, and every time we go to a battle, we, we run into these giants. They're, they're bigger than us. They're huge. You know, I, Paul and Mary, um, I just have to say on their behalf, they have been a blessing to Lisa. Praise God. They, have, they have walked every step of the way with her the minute she came into the church. She stayed with them for a while. And she was, she was, she was doing, uh, she, had, she had some issues with some addictions and and, and I don't know how long has she been clean now? Nine months. Huh? 
nine months now she's been clean. <laughs> Praise God. You know, I was telling somebody, most churches have these barometers on there, how many attend at Sunday school. We're going to have a, a barometer of how, many, how, how long people have been clean. <laughs> <laughs> Just the hand God dealt us, I guess. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. But you know what? Paul, Paul and Mary walked with them, and, and, and I was over there at Lisa's house when she heard the news of her son, and it was horrible. It was a giant, you know? It was a giant. And, and she could have reverted back into drugs and... and we sat down and with her and said, look, you're going to have to face this sober, and God's going to get you through it. Amen. And it was hard, but God got her through it. God. And uh, it's just the blessing that we have people in this church that are able to and willing to walk with people through the fire. Amen. And, uh, and so this was a giant. And... A lot of times we face things that are much bigger than us, much bigger than us. And so we have to understand that God is with us in the battle. He's with us in the battle. The Bible says that there's no temptation that's taken you, but such is common to man. And with the temptation, God will make a way of escape. He, he's right there with you in the midst of temptation and all you have to do is yield to his spirit and God's grace will be there to give you the strength to overcome. He, he's with you right there in the battle, right there in the fire. God is with us. I look back at the 21 years uh, of this history of this church. If God wasn't with me, I'd be in the nut house. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> I'm serious. I, we went through things that no other church, I mean, I called dollar prayer and they hung up on me. <laughs> That's how bad it was. <laughs> but, but I can honestly say that God is with us. He's with us. Everything that we face in life, God is with us. Emmanuel. That, that was the gift of Christmas. You know, when in the Old Testament, God used three classes of people, prophets, priests, and kings. In the New Testament, God pours out his spirit upon all flesh. And so he's with all of us. And, he, he, and he's given us power and victory in the midst of the battle because he's with us. The Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world greater and so he says you shall not be afraid of them for the Lord your God is with you who brought you up out of the land of Egypt and when you drew near to the battle the priest shall come forward and speak to the people and shall say to them hear O Israel today you are drawing near for the battle against your enemies let not your heart be faint do not be fear or panic or be in dread. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against the enemies and to give you the victory. Amen. God's with you to give you the victory. So you plus God equals victory. Amen. Amen. You plus God equals victory. But you plus religion equals what? Disaster. You could know the scriptures backwards and forwards and, and live in your sin and, and quote them. But if God, is, if you have grieved the spirit of God because of your sin and your rebellion, he's not with you. Amen. He's not with you. Because sin separates us from the very presence of God. And it's not until we repent that God, the Bible says, draw nigh unto God. And, and what will happen? 
he will draw nigh unto you. And then what do you do? Resist the devil, and what will happen? He will flee from you. So if you don't have the presence of God, if you haven't drawn nigh unto God and he has drawn nigh unto you and you're trying to resist the devil, it ain't going to happen. You need to repent and draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. Hallelujah. Okay, that's not in my notes, so that was extra. Now listen to this. I, I love this story because this illustrates it. Uh, this is a, about a king named Jehoshaphat. That doesn't mean Joe is so fat. <laughs> Jehoshaphat, that was his name, Jehoshaphat. And uh, Second Chronicles, I, I love this story. This, this is just illustrates what I'm talking about. After the Moabites and the Ammonites and all them of the Midianites, the, yeah, the Mennonites, came against Jehoshaphat for the battle. So there, there was these, and, and so came men and told Jeho Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Eden and free, from beyond the sea. And behold, they are in Hazan Tamar, that is in Engedi. So Jehoshaphat gets this news, hello? Hey, Jehoshaphat, there's, three, there's, there's a great multitude coming against you. Whoa, wouldn't that scare you? A, a great multitude coming against you. A whole bunch of people wanting to destroy you. And so, listen to this. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid. You know, fear is just a natural emotion. When, when something happens to you, uh, it's, it's normal to be afraid. It's, it's normal for fear to all of a sudden come on you. But listen to what he did. He was afraid and he set his face to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all of Judea and Judah and assembled to seek help from the Lord for all the cities of Judah and they came to seek the Lord. So he, he got this bad news and and uh, he, he was afraid at first, man, there's a whole bunch of armies, and I'm sure that he thought, well, they're going to ramsack our houses and steal everything, you know. But then, you know, whenever you get bad news or, or whatever, you, you go through something, all the negative stuff comes to your mind, doesn't it, of, of what could happen. And so I'm sure all this was going on, but he stopped it, and he said, no, let, let's, let's fast and pray. Let's get everybody together and seek the Lord and see what God's going to do in this situation. So that's what he did. He, he, he called a fast and he got everybody together. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And he said, O Lord God, our fathers, are, uh, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations, your hand and power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of the land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friends? What was Jehoshaphat doing? What was he doing? He was magnifying the Lord, magnifying God. He, you know, sometimes we think our enemies are bigger than God. And Jehoshaphat got a hold of himself. He started to pray and fast, and then he'd start magnifying God. David said, oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name for, together, because I sought the Lord, and he heard and he delivered me from all my fears. And so that's what Jehoshaphat was doing. In, in, the, in the midst of his fear, he started magnifying God and remembering how big God is. Remember that song? My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and he is. He's, he's bigger than all of your enemies. And that really really hit home the other day when we were in our Bible study on Thursday nights and 
and we were talking about God and theology and, and how great God is. And, and Wes said that his hand spans the universe. And the earth is just like a little speck in his eyes. And I thought, man, my problems are so small compared to a God whose hand spans the universe. Isn't that awesome? He is big and mighty. And, and Jehoshaphat was, was magnifying the Lord. And sometimes that's what you have to do. In the midst of the battle, you have to say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is with me, bless his holy name. And don't forget all of his benefits. You have to remind yourself of God's glory and his goodness and how big he is. And then verse 12, he said, our God will not execute judgment uh, uh, on them, for we are powerless. He was crying out to God to execute judgment on them. For we are powerless against this great multitude that is coming against us, and we don't know what to do. How many have ever been there? You're facing a giant, and you say, God, I'm powerless against this thing. And I don't know what to do. I've had all the counseling. I've had all the prayers. I've had have all the stuff, but, but I don't know what to do. I don't have any strength when, within me to fight this devil. I love this next six words he said. But my eyes are on you. Hallelujah. But my eyes are on you, God. They're on you. I don't know what to do. I don't have any strength to fight this. It's bigger than me. It's, I just can't do it. But my eyes are on you. My eyes are on you. And, and look at the rest of the story. Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones and their wives and their children. I like this. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. <laughs> I like that. I mean, they were doing everything right. They were crying out to God. They're, they were saying, they start fasting and praying and saying, God, we, we, we don't have the strength to do this, but our eyes are on you and the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. Jehezreel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Beaniah, the son of Jehiel, trying to say these best, the son of Mathaniah, a Levite of the son of Asaph, of <clears throat> in the midst of the assembly and he said listen all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat thus saith the Lord to you so the spirit of the Lord came upon a prophet and he began to say thus saith the Lord unto you do not be afraid and do not be dismayed of this great multitude for the battle is not yours but God's so tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up uh, by the uh, ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of uh, Jeril. Battles, stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. Then Jehoshaphat bowed his head and his face to the ground. <coughs> and all of Ju Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord and worshiped the Lord and the Levites and the Kehonites and uh, they stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very 
rose up early in the morning in the wilderness of Tea. When they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe in his prophets, and you will be successful, succeed. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he anointed those who were the singers to the Lord and praised, praised him in holy attire, and they went before the army. Isn't that something? So God tells to, to anoint the singers, get them all dressed up, and send them out before the army. Can you imagine what the worship team thought? We want to go behind the army. <laughs> don't, don't, don't send us out before the army. I mean, they were like, <laughs> you know. But God said, send, send, send the worship team out there before the army. And just start worshiping me and, and worshiping and, and saying and, and give thanks to the Lord God for his steadfastness, love, and endurance forever. Now listen to this. And when they began to sing praises, what would have happened if they didn't begin to sing praises? What if... What if uh, what if Jehoshaphat would have said, no, God, this just don't make sense. I mean, I'm going to send the army out. We're going to have all our big guns. We, you know, we're going to get our tanks going out there. And, you know, and then maybe we'll sing some courses in the background or something. No, God said, send them out first before the army. And when they began to sing and praise the Lord, the Lord sent ambush against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah. So they were, uh, they were routed from the men of Ammon and Moab. And they rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, uh, devoting them to devouring them to destruction. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they all helped uh, to destroy one another. So God caused them to wind up fighting against each other and destroying one another. And so God fought that battle for them. And if you go through that, if you take time and you look at that story, just underline all the things that they did prior to the fight. And I think those are steps that God wants us to take. You know, we're, we're gonna have fear, but we're gonna, we've gotta shut the noise of the fear off and start seeking God. And then we gotta get people praying with us and believing with us. And, and then we gotta begin to worship God and, and have our eyes upon him. And then we'll see God bring us and give us the victory. Amen, amen. You know, sometimes we feel that God is not with us. Has anybody ever felt that? You just feel God's not with you and when you're going through stuff, you know, you, you just don't feel God's right there with you. You know, God's not a feeling, and, and sometimes we, we just can't trust our emotions. But God is always with you. And even when you're going through stuff, he's with you. And when I think of Joseph in the Old Testament, I mean, God gave this man a vision. He was a young teenager that he was going to uh, rule over his brothers. And, uh, you know, he had this vision and he began to tell them what was going on. And, and then they, they got rid of him. You know, they were going to, they were jealous. And so they, they put him in a pit. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure Joseph was thinking, God, you gave me this vision and now I'm in this pit. You know, what's going on? I was, I was supposed to rule over these people that just threw me in the pit. And then, then he gets sold into slavery, you know? And, you know, it gets worse and worse. And then he, 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 he gets promoted and he, and he winds up uh, in, in this man's house and his wife accuses him of, of sexual immorality and, and then he gets thrown in prison again. I'm sure he thought, 
<coughs> where, where are you, God? You know, what, what's going on? But you know, we did a study one time on, on God's upper story and lower story. And sometimes we don't understand God's upper story. But it's in his upper story that he's working out our lower story. And we live in the lower story, so we don't sometimes understand what God's doing up here. And that's what God was doing with Joseph. Sometimes we don't feel, feel God with us in the midst of all this stuff, but in the upper story, God's working things all out for your good and your glory, for God's glory. So in the Old Testament, we see God is with his people externally, but in the New Testament, God is working in us and through us by his Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 9, it says, Now if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit even have more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness much far exceeding in glory. So what God is saying, you think that was glorious back there. You just wait till he sees people see what God's going to do through his people in the new covenant. And that's you and me. That's you and me. And then it says in verse 18, but we all with open face behold as a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as even by the Spirit of the Lord. So God is manifesting his glory in every one of us as we change from glory to glory to glory. Now, if you haven't changed in, in five years, something's not right. It's usually because you're resisting the Holy Spirit and and you haven't yield to God building character in your life, and so you haven't changed. But God wants to take you from glory to glory to glory. And I've seen a lot of people in this church, God is changing a lot of people, and, and you're not where you used to be. You might not be where you want to be, but you're not where you used to be. And God has brought you from glory to glory to glory. And we're all going to keep going through this process until the day we leave this earth. And then we'll, we'll be like him. But God is always working out things in our life and, and building godly character in us. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. You're, you're the temple of God. See, in the Old Testament, he, he dwelt in, 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 a, in a physical temple. But now you're the temple of God. You're the temple of God. And the Bible says, if that same spirit rose Christ from the dead, dwells in you, he shall also make alive your mortal body. And the Bible tells us not to defile that temple because we have the presence of God living inside of us. God is with us as, a, as our advocate. He's with us as the author and the finisher of our faith. He's with us as the bread of life. He's with us as our great counselor. Aren't you glad that you can sometimes just go to God and get counsel by his spirit? And let him speak to your heart. We gotta do something with this. It's driving me bananas. He's with you as a great deliverer. He's with you as the good shepherd. He's with you as the great high priest. He's with you as the mediator. In first John four four it says, You are of God, little children and have overcome them, you've overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And you know, 
the Bible says that he, whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. Amen. Overcomes the world. You don't let the world overcome you, but you overcome the world. Amen. Because greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. In Zephaniah 3.17, we, we talked about that last week. It said, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save and rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love, and he will joy over thee with singing. That's an awesome verse. He's with us when we gather together in his name. Matthew 18, 20. For when two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. And I believe that. I believe that when we get together and fellowship and worship God, Spirit is in the midst of us. Amen. He's in the midst of us. When two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. Isaiah 43 says, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and that has formed thee, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, for thou art mine. Isn't that awesome? God's redeemed us. That means he's bought us back. And we belong to him. We're his. You know, when I was in the army, you became government property when you were in the army. I mean, if somebody hit you, they could be arrested for destroying government property. And you were theirs. But now we belong to God. And we're his. And if somebody harms us, woe unto them. <laughs> That's why the Bible says, vengeance is mine, say the Lord. But we always say, I know that, Lord, but can I watch? <laughs> Don't look all sanctified. I probably know a bunch of you that... <laughs> <laughs> when you when you pass through the water what's going to happen i will be with you Amen. through the rivers they shall not overflow you when you walk through the fire you're not going to be burned neither will the flames kindle upon you for i am the lord thy god the holy one of israel thy savior and then matthew 28:19 Go you in all the world, teaching all nations, baptizing them in the, nation, in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you, how many times? Always. Always. I heard somebody use that verse saying, well, the Bible says we shouldn't fly because it says, lo, I am with you always. That was a bad joke. <laughs> but he says, teaching them and observing things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Even unto the end of the world. That's why I like that song, Amazing Grace. Even when we've been there 10,000 years, bright, shining as the stars, We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Why? Because he's with us. He's with us. John, he's with us, brother. We're not fighting this alone. Hallelujah. The Bible says that one shall, shall send a thousand to flight and two ten thousand. That's, that's the power and the might that you have inside of you. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's the gift of Christmas, Emmanuel, God with us. Hallelujah. Somebody says, God be with you. Well, you could say, well, he is. <laughs> Amen, he is. Amen. He's not going to be. He is with us. He, he's with us. Amen. Let's pray.
Lord, I thank you for the gifts of your son that brought God with us in our hearts, in our spirits. And Lord, if, if there's any out here today that have, have broken fellowship with you because of the rebellions of their heart, God, I, I just pray you said if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we draw nigh unto you, we, you will draw nigh unto us. I think the, the most important thing, like David cried out in Psalms 51, Lord, don't take your presence from me. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. So, Lord, we cry out today that your presence would go with us every day, every minute, every hour, every second. God, we stand here as a church, as your people, and we say, God, if you don't go with us, we're not going any further. So, Lord, I ask that you would descend upon us because our eyes are upon you and we have no strength within ourselves, Lord. But we believe because of greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world will have victory because you are with us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Give the Lord a clap offering this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen.